Welcome to WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast from Pharma Voice. This episode is made possible by a generous sponsorship from Perohit Navigation. For more information, visit perohitnavigation.com. In this episode, Taryn Grom, co-founder and editor-in-chief of Pharma Voice, meets with Kamala Madali, PhD, president and founder, Health Collaborations, LLC. Kamala, welcome to our WOW podcast program. Thank you so much, and I thank everyone for taking time to listen, and especially thanks to you for taking time to really bring um, so many wonderful voices across the industry ecosystem together. Well, thank you for that. And you're one of those important voices across the ecosystem. So I'm really eager to dig in. Kamala, you are an author, a speaker, a DEI champion, a C suite executive, an entrepreneur, a precision medicine expert, a rare disease patient, and an inspiring leader. How do you manage all of these personas? First of all, Darren, you're good at capturing and following me. <laughs> all the avatars that I have actually taken, and I mean it, all the avatars. Because, first of all, we are all in healthcare with many of us with our educational backgrounds passion you know learning so education is the backbone of where we are today how we are applying our experiences and expertise i just want to remind everyone there is a quote from albert einstein which always motivates me education is not the learning of facts but the training of the mind to think. If you just give a little pause, isn't that really what we are doing today and what we are supposed to do today and what we are actually learning? The more we are learning about the challenges in healthcare, the making of the human body intelligence, we're like, we're not just learning the facts, we're actually training the mind from the failures or the lack of understandings. How else do we approach? How else do we adopt? How else do we succeed? So, you know, with that intention, there are many, I have taken these, uh, literally a trend shift, a paradigm shift. Do I want to be really restricted to only one role or one, more than a role, responsibility? So that's where really I've learned almost this was an eye-opening sort of awakening phase since 2013, wherein I decided um, I have to really understand the adoption of innovation that's happening from the pharmaceutical world and the diagnostic world, but how is it impacting at the patient level, at the physician level? And also, obviously, on top of that, my own journey, my own personal experience as a rare disease patient has started since 2012. And I started really taking a unique dimension and approach in anything I do, not only learning the fact, but also training the mind to think and then contribute to the role that I am in and the responsibility I take in and communicate it in a very unique way. That's where the diversity aspect comes in. How do we really bring the change that we are supposed to see and bring the impact that we are supposed to see with all the wonderful innovation happening? Hope that is helpful, Taryn. Yes, it's incredibly inspiring to me how you can manage, as you call them, all these different avatars. And we're going to dig into your rare disease patient uh, experience a little bit later on. But in terms of your list of uh, attributes, I noted author first, only because your book, Becoming a Kamala, just launched. Tell me about the book, what motivated you to write it, and what you hope readers come away with. Thank you. Thank you for that. So nice of you to bring it up about bring up about the book, the topic, because once again, it reflects who who I am as a human rather than more as just as a professional, right? With degrees and then accolades and roles and responsibilities. I think it applies to every one of us. Um, I'm sure it will connect to a lot of people who are really having um, difficulty in understanding, okay, what am I becoming? Where am I? Once again, the same dilemma 
I go through even today. And this was more evident 10 years ago or more, more, much more evident five years ago. It's like, wow, I'm in the epicenter of innovation and I'm understanding so much beyond uh, what the textbook has taught me 22 years ago, because I'm a clinician by background too, by the way. Um, I'm a veterinarian by training. So I'm like, wow. So what am I learning from this? And now this whole battle as a rare disease patient, what am I becoming? Because as we all know, some might be diagnosed with a condition, some might be a caregiver with someone dealing with a condition, some might be dealing with something which you don't even have a diagnosis. Let's take, for example, all of the mental health scenarios. Despite all the accomplishments, we humans try to mull over what we don't have or what is bothering us as of today. I really wanted to break that norm. I wanted to chronicle all my experiences since my childhood. Am I Kamala Madali that got a degree 20 years ago versus am I Kamala Madali who was born 43 years ago? Now you know my age. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> So, you know, so really, if I can I chronicle my experiences? Can I understand really who am I? Was the thought that came in and I wanted to really pencil it down. And I'm like, how am I able to battle certain things, which I started to understand? And I'm like, why am I able to battle? Why couldn't I do that a few years mm -hmm. ago? But just why now? I personally think when you chronicle all your experiences, meaning not just successes, but failures, those are the unique learning experiences and growing experiences. Failure is first attempt in learning and we all really knowingly or intentionally or unintentionally, when we have some wisdom kicked in, we will do some unintentional mistakes or failures. But when you open the mindset, of learning from a failure, then a beautiful, unique version of you is blooming within you. That exactly what really, you know, when I started putting various aspects of my life, my personal life, my educational sort of an avatar as a student, as a daughter, once again, personal life as a daughter, as a wife, as a mother, once again, as a woman, the most important aspect as a woman, as a human and then as a rare disease patient. It really gave me that opportunity to dive, to dive into the cosmic experience and really the oceanic view of, deep oceanic view of who am I, number one, who I will be, number two, what else I can be. I think as, as humans, we are all talking about mental health issues so much throughout the world, right? If you really take time and chronicle your experiences, there is that beautiful, unique version of you that is learning not only from the wonderful, blessed successes, but also from the failures. I think everyone who is actually battling with, you know, these questions, and there are these greater learnings and experiences you can learn from your own journey, and also reading journeys like mine or anyone else, you know, who have written their experiences as memoirs or a part of their sort of, you know, journaling, they are publicly shared. I think even, even leveraging those sources will make huge difference and it will really bring the change that we all want to see. Most people don't get these things handed out to them. You know it very well, Taran, and I know it very well. And I know that for a fact, because we all need to make the most of what we are given with and cook the meal with what is given to you, just like the beautiful food TV shows that you might have seen, but cook that with gratitude, with hope and with what we desire. And then the outcome is just wonderful. Don't cook it with expectations or don't pursue your goals with a certain expectation. Just live in it despite the outcome. Then you will learn from that outcome. I hope you know this journey where I actually um, openly talked about including my suicidal journey, where I realized what I'm learning from that. 
almost 20 years after what, what, what has happened because there's so many rebirths in my journey as a rare disease patient. Sometimes I fall, sometimes, you know, I have catatonic sort of attacks where I'm like frozen like a vegetable. I can hear everything, I can see, but I cannot talk or move. But when you really, you know, listen to someone's journey, I think it will have a huge impact, huge benefit to a reader or to so anyone who takes time because every one of us have certain big dreams that we are aspiring for. And every one of us are fighting a desperate situation. And few of us might be just simply bored of all our ordinary lives. And my, my pure intention is if a blend of my six failures primarily, including the outcomes of successes from those learning failures can inspire me, number one, to stay what I'm becoming. And then number two, anyone in the journey who wants to prosper and then survive and be thankful with gratitude like a lotus. Kamala means a lotus. Lotus grows in muddy waters. And the muddy water is equivalent to the challenges of our lives. But when we pursue our challenges or failures with an open mind and gratitude, we become that flower, that infinite resilience flower, learning from the adversity. But when we wrap it up with gratitude, right, we build the most, the one of the best attributes of leadership, which is self-empowerment. Self-empowerment, which brings you onto the path to transformation in everything you pursue. That's why I named the title Becoming a Kamala, meaning I'm really becoming a lotus, that resilient flower. And the biology of this flower is it grows in groups. That's why I want to see circle of Kamalas in my life. And special thanks to you, Taryn, wherein you know many of those lotuses within the healthcare industry. That's why you're bringing these voices together and then letting the world be inspired or the listener be inspired to unveil their hidden sort of, you know, talent and sort of, you know, unique experience they can bring to the world. That's where this memoir is all about dedicating to that unique version of you and only you. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for being so open and vulnerable to sharing such a personal story with us on this podcast, but as well as through your book. And you are a lotus, you are a beautiful flower. And the resilience that you have shown through your life and through your career is certainly commendable and inspiring. Um, you know, taking all that you've learned from being a rare disease patient, and we're gonna delve into what led to your passion for precision medicine um, and why this particular area of science resonates with you. And at the same time, as you said, you're managing all these different roles. You're a, you're a woman, you're a leader, you're a mother, you're a daughter. Um, all of that on top of leading a company, writing a book, being an advocate, it's, it's quite a lot. Um, and so what is the secret to your success in terms of balancing all of that? Number one is one. <laughs> oh my God. I, I can keep on. It's like you're asking, okay, here is the sky. How many stars are there? Count the stars. Right. So, yeah, I get that. <laughs> no, no, no. What I mean is there are so many, so many ways to inspire ourselves, right? Despite even if you are in a role or not. I always, I realized while I was even chronicling my experiences in my memoir is like, we all are surrounded, including me, with people with uh, sort of, you know, personalities historically, right, you know, leaders or inspiring gurus or spiritualists, scientists in our field. And there is so much to be inspired by. So first thing is, when you open up your intelligence to that perception of inspiration around you, right? There are so many ways to be inspired and to be driven. And 
being a human itself is the number one thing that I would say we are the most supreme intelligent walking walking personality right walking sort of you know sort of the um how do I say stars walking stars I always call it as because that's where the today's intelligence of the human body that we are unveiling what we are made of trillions uncountable trillions of cells and the synergy between these cells how we are functioning on a microsecond to microsecond that quantum second I would say right and how we really are made out of first the number one is that have really that gratitude and thankfulness for actually being born as a human it's just that itself infuses a lot of positivity and unparalleled energy in anything that you perceive that's why I think we all need to share those sort of journeys and stories about what you are actually and how you have become through both of your successes and failures which will actually kind of bloom more and more personalities like us and then learning learning never ends when you really shift your mindset from just interpretation to learning it actually is constant training your every sort of a role or responsibility personally and professionally that you are taking is actually building those blocks like right those building blocks once again not the blocks that are stumbling but building blocks that's where that mindset is so important otherwise we all I'm sure many of us would have juggled through this oh my god I'm stuck in this role I, I personally think in addition to your full-time responsible role take an opportunity if you are in healthcare or if you are in tech field anywhere at the end of the day every one of these are for the prosperity of us as humans right for the good health of the humans take time to advocate for an organization take time to advocate for a person and that's where your multiple avatars are very helpful that's why we have the most complex mindset so you know so mindset and also the biology of the brain um, so I would say take opportunity for mentoring others in what you have excelled that's where some of my roles are mentoring companies mentoring people or mentoring organizations take opportunity to network networking is such a key aspect of um, human growth and professional growth and also it's an opportunity for educating others as well depends on the role and the responsibility that you take and then be always a mentee as well go and look out for other so mentors wherever you want to grow personally or professionally might be in a scientific aspect might be in a business aspect might be in a strategy aspect that's where I have pursued many of these roles wherein it's a combination of learning growing giving mentoring and being mentored excellent let's switch tacks a little bit let's delve into your passion for precision medicine why this area of science for you oh boy you actually are, are asking the most favorite question for me which is definitely precision medicine let me take um, a step back actually what is precision medicine so all of us know the word medicine which is basically so classically we have seen one drug if you have headache you are given that that drug someone else will be given the same drug and then shifting gears from a simple headache scenario to cancer the word cancer I think I heard in my eighth grade when I was studying my biology classes about how a cell replicates or reproduces but now it's becoming a common word that's scary right it's becoming common wherein a neighbor or a friend in my case a 43 year old beautiful the most beautiful aunt youngest aunt of mine in less than nine months died with lung cancer um, and yeah. seven year old niece no thank you Tara seven year old niece a distant niece who I knew him just three years ago and um, two years ago he passed away he passed away with brain cancer appendidoma 
So, you know, and uh, once again, and then through my advocacy activities, I know I pretty much I wake up, I think, every day um, with someone, you know, battling with cancer or who have given up their life due to cancer. So the cancer field, especially is where precision medicine has given a lot of hope, meaning precise medicine, because what we have learned in this past 15 years, especially, and 10 years much more aggressively and deeply, I must say, is our genetic makeup, the DNA, which is the which is the soul of our of our body, right? The DNA is what the genes is what defining your responses to a disease, or even your responses, your day-to-day -day activities, what you do, what you think, what you drink. What do you think? I really mean it. Data is coming. How you react, you know, your lifestyles, uh, everything is contributing to genetic changes. And these diseases just don't come overnight and they build up. So they attack your immune system. So we are learning that in cancer, more than 15 to 20 pathways are compromised or challenged. And scientists have really unveiled those hallmarks of cancer and they're designing now um, novel medications or drugs targeting those pathways or genes that are actually activating those pathways. So technically, if I walk in and got diagnosed with cancer, first thing is I would go through genetic testing or DNA testing, and in some cases, RNA testing as well. And then they would actually you know, match me with a trial or a treatment which is targeting that particular type of genetic pathway. So that's where precision medicine is, wherein it is the right drug for the right patient based on your right makeup, meaning right testing, which is in the context of genes, it will be right genetic testing. Or if it's a protein, like for example, in the context of uh, one of the most uh, sort of, you know, uh, widely adopted drugs is Keytruda, wherein they also came up with not only genetic biomarkers, but protein-based or circulating biomarkers, we call it as, some of them in the form of protein. So you really need to go through that particular aspect of testing the patient, which would define access to the treatment and trial. But not only we made a lot of advancements in this past seven years, especially, mm -hmm. tremendous number of drugs, tremendous, tremendous innovations happen, but the impact is not seen at the rate at which it needs to be seen, Taran. One of the biggest challenges is community, right? Patients go to community. You and I want to go to a community doctor first, not to Johns Hopkins or Mayo Clinic, which is three hours or four hours away, right? So innovation has to go. Innovation in the form of testing, trials, and treatments should go to the patient and to the doctor. They cannot just keep on running towards this innovation because there is so much coming. So I think that's where the role of artificial intelligence comes in strongly in augmenting our intelligence with what we have invented thus far and accessing the intelligence and accelerating our intelligence access in the context of precision medicine. So the doctor has all the tools in that one-on-one -on -one conversation as they are you know, treating the patient. And when the patient comes back with more resistant cancer or for example, more resistant disease or recurring disease, so that's where really precision medicine has a huge role play, but we're also learning a lot from the facts as we are adopting. And that's where AI is coming into play from uh, development of novel drugs, better drugs based on the unique biologies of the patients to adoption of these precision medicine innovations. That's heady stuff there, my friend. Wow. <laughs> And it all links back to your initial statement about Einstein. It's not just about learning the facts, but it's training your brain to think differently and to think about um, different ways of uh, of working, of thinking, etc. Um, you are certainly very much a role model for so many. What does this mantle of responsibility mean to you? You talked about earlier about being a mentor to others. What is your philosophy on being a role model? 
And um, thank you for that question. That means a lot, and I'll apply it into the context of medicine, actually. Um, I, I wanted to be um, an MD, but then I saw my family pursue an entrepreneurial path. None of them were pharmacists, but a couple of them, including my father, was a chemist. And there itself, I didn't knew the term STEM or STEAM that we call today, that we want mm. our, our kids, right? Our nieces, nephews, all of them uh, want to pursue. But are we talking about STEM in, um, in our real life? And also in our professional roles? It is actually the STEM approach we are taking. So one of the learnings that I realized uh, midway through my career was that's when I learned the STEM concepts in the United States. I'm like, oh my God, everything is a collaboration. Everything is a collaboration, which, which unveils the higher sources and the higher adoption, adoptive capabilities of innovation. It can be your mindset. It can be the inventions and the discoveries that we humans are doing. So that's where I think really um, the mantle for us is, and it's also a responsibility that we have to have collaborative approaches um, as families, as communities, as companies, as, you know, really, you know, even the, in the context of um, investment portfolios, right, wherein we are realizing how many of us, say, let's take the example of COVID, how many of us have really pulled a collaborative angle, unveiled a collaborative angle. Oh my God, we can cross apply this drug into the COVID arena in battling with this sort of a sort of a side effect or this sort of a sign or even addressing COVID also directly. And then the same thing happened in the testing industry. Every company that actually had an instrument for genetic testing or antibody testing actually shifted their portfolio and collaborated strongly to address, you know, uh, the testing needs and the screening needs and the diagnostic needs. And when you take that from a personality perspective, especially in healthcare, my request to anyone that is pursuing, that might be midway or that might be even in an executive level or a board level at every level, including the student level is, the art of medicine, especially the art of healthcare consists of three elements. Hippocrates greatest quote, this one is, the disease, the patient and the doctor. We hmm. really need to approach it from that way. Interesting. So from the disease, from the patient, and from the physician, and that's how we should be looking at medicine? Yes. Okay. That's yes. awesome. And that's where your avatars are very much meaning the roles and responsibilities. Don't mm -hmm. restrict your potential to only, oh, I can only contribute to my full-time role. Take time, take time and advise another company, which is not a competitor, but which can be a collaborator. Take time and advise a nonprofit organization focused on patient component. Or take mm -hmm. time and call your doctor friend who is not up to speed with the innovation because this, this change is coming. We will be seeing doctors, doctor scientists, doctor engineers, engineer doctor, doctor chemists, all combinations will be coming in the roles that we'll be taking. Interesting view to the future. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, you touched on some of this a little bit earlier in terms of some of the things that women might need to do or that things that you've done to get um, ahead and reach that executive level. Um, in addition to networking and being collaborative, what are some of the other things that women who may want to reach that C-suite um, what what should what should be they be doing to to achieve that goal? Oh, great! No, that's very good question, and many women, including with my most recent role, where I was actually the vice chair for Women in Bio Philadelphia, where I noticed, oh my God, Philadelphia doesn't have a chapter for Women in Bio, which is which was focused on, uh, which is still focused on life sciences aspects. Um, Build your circles. If there is something that you want to contribute, speak about it, communicate. And that is the, that is the, how do I say, that is the first attribute of empowerment, right? You're advocating for, for it, for an observation or a change that you really want to bring. Even if you're alone, don't hesitate. 
speak about it and build your circle so that's where um, the the attribute of empowerment is so powerful wherein reach out to other women reach out to organizations and it need not be always a super big mega organization because you need to interact with people there are not enough organizations trust me you know who really want to bring the change and you really need to uh, be a part of an organization if you want to uh, um, say start with a small change and then go into part of a big organization where you can be you know you know you can resonate your vision and your perceptions will resonate ultimately with that sort of an organization first thing is empowerment starting with self empowerment don't hesitate to talk about your sort of a perception or sort of a observation so you need to communicate and then you need to collaborate so build your circles personal advisory boards is something i would highly recommend if i look back i recently came across this term so i'm not trying to take the credit i will give the credit to whoever came up with that in the industry but build your own advisory boards mm. that's why that's why it's important right build your circles and then you know build your mentors not only and also build your mentee circle and mentor circle these are very important diverse unique aspects um and it's all obviously the the backbone for this is taran as you well as you know well networking talk to people when you talk to people you will find some sort of alignment in some aspects so build those buckets okay who do i go after when i need something like this so even within those mentor and mentee circles come up with those speciality sort of you know traits or attributes and in my in my experience it's a never ending experience because it's a good thing because it's also a good change because as you are learning the facts as i said you are actually training the mind to think oh good now i have built this pillar of success of perseverance um i need to build this uh, pillar of success of patience well, or say passion more i want to learn more you know then go and seek uh, mentorship from someone in the industry or someone say in the academia who could really you know connect with you and talk to you and carve out the time and give back give back that's a very important aspect because mm. that's the law of attraction right agreed yep so you know that's when you actually raise the next generation leaders and thinkers and doers so that selfless intention is very important as well i love that selfless intention yes it is about giving back it it can't be a two way street when you're going to build those circles you have to give as much as you get for sure and finally because this is our wow podcast program i'm going to ask you to identify an accomplishment or a wow moment that either shaped your career or changed the trajectory of your career and i'm going to hold you to one if you can okay that's tough darren okay so you might have to pull me into a second podcast next time okay <laughs> <laughs> so you know since it's wow focused on women sort of um, um empowerment aspects um i will actually take a moment especially when um, after i launched women in bio philadelphia chapter with my chair duni odimusu i take up her name as a moment of gratitude because that's one thing we as women we need to advocate for other women right who have really you know so so brought us that opportunity to uh, bring that empowering moments in our life that wow moment so as a non profit women in bio was invited for uh ringing the closing bell ceremony of new york stock exchange how exciting oh oh fabulous moment really you know lively moment wherein we were there in the in the world of per profit companies right many out there and then we went out there and we had that moment of giving back and being recognized for our selfless intentions because one of the main goals of women bio is raise more boardroom ready leaders raise more c suite leaders more senior leaders at every level 
at every level they had wonderful leadership programs and women in bio was very well recognized for those efforts of board dream ready programs so that was really an amazing moment wherein you know what that woman stands for that's when i realized wonderful wonderful man man is actually a unisexual term as per the medical dictionary it's not just a masculine side <laughs> So it's that wonderful human in us was that moment that unveiled when we all were invited for the closing bell ceremony of New York Stock Exchange, actually. So we really have that uh, traits in us as wonderful women to really raise wonderful humans despite of being a man or woman and build those walls of collaboration between both sides of humanity and bring a much better empowered world to address the greater battles in humans sort of you know sort of uh, how do i say day to day traumatic experiences with health wow that is an amazing wow and congratulations and i have to tell you i think you are a fabulous human so um thank you for bringing your full kamala to this a podcast and for sharing so many wonderful insights and being so open and transparent because it's not easy to talk about some of the things you discussed and um i so appreciate your your bringing your story to our wow podcast program thank you so much oh you're welcome taran and let us become the change we all want to see you know by building the right circles thank you thank you for listening to this episode of wow the woman of the week podcast Thanks again to Perohit Navigation for sponsoring this episode. For more information, visit perohitnavigation.com. And don't forget to check out our other WOW podcast episodes at pharmavoice.com slash WOW. This 2021 program is copyrighted by PharmaLinks, LLC.